Hi everyone, we're really excited to be at Cloud Native North America WASM Day 2021. It's a real honor to be selected to talk today and we have some really exciting stuff packed into the next 20 minutes or so. Um, we want to talk about the use of WebAssembly server-side and how it's driving a revolution in platform design. Coupled with products like WASM Cloud and NATS, WebAssembly is creating a new paradigm for Cloud Native, which as new paradigms should, eliminates entire classes of problems that we struggle with today when building distributed applications. But before we dive into that, let's introduce ourselves. I'm Stuart Harris, founder and chief scientist at Red Badger. And I'm Ayush, I'm a senior software engineer at Red Badger, and I'll be going through the demo later on. We're a London-based consultancy that's obsessed with helping organizations streamline their ability to deliver digital products or services. We're very honored to be here and a big thank you to CNCF for organizing this event today. As a consultancy, we've experienced the pain over and over again of building microservice applications with today's architectures. It's not straightforward by any stretch of the imagination and there's a lot to think about. One of our clients, one of Europe's largest banks, engaged us recently to describe to them what a future, state, a future state platform architecture could look like. They want to prepare themselves for a world where they can easily deploy workloads securely and reliably across on-premise and any cloud without having to constantly adjust network topology to suit. This is really refreshing that large enterprises are thinking ahead like this, but this thinking is driven by their pain of working with today's complexity. We've built a proof of concept to show what such a platform might look like. It's a really cool demo and I'm just going to show you in a minute. But first, some background. Um, it seems to us as though the last decade has been characterized by a rush to the cloud. Now that we're there, well, most of us, we're rightly worried about having all our eggs in one basket, and we've realized that it's still far too complicated. It's easier than filling out a form and sending it to the IT department, but the burden of managing infrastructure is all too real. I think the next decade will be characterized by a rush out of the cloud. Well, not out completely, but out enough to be independent of any one provider. And out enough to make good use of the edge, on-premise, internet of things, etc. If you're in a regulated industry like finance or healthcare, the regulator will insist that you have a get out plan. These plans aren't real though. You wouldn't be able to execute them, at least not quickly or cheaply. They're really just there to satisfy the regulator. The cost of moving everything to another cloud provider is going to be prohibitive. Containers and Kubernetes have been an eye opener for our industry. It's the first time that there has been a standard and consistent and uniform way to deploy our applications, regardless of which cloud provider we want to use. But we're still locked into cloud provider specific services. AWS is famous for the number of services it keeps introducing and every cloud provider specific service that we use locks us in even further. Kubernetes was the first step on this ladder, but what's the next step? It definitely needs to be multi-cloud, or I should say multi-location. And to do that, it needs to sit above the HTTP TCP networking stack that dominates microservices today. But multi-cloud is not really a thing, not yet, not transparently. The best we can do today is to join discrete Kubernetes clusters together in a service mesh using point-to-point -point connections between cloud providers. And we can't yet have workloads that are truly location independent. The next step on the ladder out of the cloud, or let's say above the cloud, is WebAssembly running server-side on one of the many runtimes that we have now. And probably with a platform like Wasm Cloud, running on top of NATS, on top of Kubernetes for now, on top of cloud. Today, Ayush and I want to talk about how these technologies are changing the game completely. So let's start with a demo. Ayush is going to blow our socks off. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Stu. Um, so yeah, as Stu mentioned, I'm going to be demonstrating a service fault tolerance in a multi-cloud architecture. Um, in other words, we're going to be running the uh, same application code in two different clouds, well, two different uh, Kubernetes clusters within that. And um, so yeah, we'll just see um, once one of the actors become unavailable, 
or unhealthy for whatever reason, how does a service uh, fail over to the another uh, our healthy service running in the other cluster? Uh, but before we jump into our demo, I uh, wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the um, architecture of what a platform looks like when you're working with uh, Wasm Cloud. So here um, we uh, have two clouds, two cloud providers. So you have GCP and AWS, and within that you have this Docker line or Docker container, um, which is essentially our pod. So it's running in Kubernetes and it has a pod um, and a service that. So we have a Wasm Cloud host runtime running as a pod and on which you can um, schedule your Wasm workloads and be able to scale them. And obviously with you leveraging the Kubernetes um, capabilities, you're able to scale your pods as well. So that's what a platform looks like um, when you're working with Wasm Cloud um, host runtime. But for this uh, group of concepts, um, the architecture that we went with was um, having a, uh, a pod, a Wasm Cloud uh, host runtime pod, each for a type of uh, Wasm workload that we wanted to run. So uh, as you can see, our Wasm Cloud pod B is running our business logic, and uh, respectively, our Wasm Cloud pod A and C are running our um, capability providers. Um, so it just becomes easier for us to identify and also simulate outage when we have this kind of architecture. So that's why we went with something like this. Um, so yeah, so just talking about our business logic. So we have our to-do application. So it's just another to-do application uh, that also supports all the CRUD operations. Um, and it, comp uh, it complies with, our to uh, with the to-do backend spec. So we have a to-do uh, actor running in both of the clouds. And then we want to be able to um, make a request to those to-do actors running into different clouds. So we have an external IP. Uh, so that's why we have um, two HTTP capability providers as well. In, uh, sorry, one each. And uh, so yeah, we can make a request to our to-do actor. Um, so yeah, and then we have just one uh, database. This was to rep represent our uh, client's mainframe system. So where they have only one database, then everything is just built on top of that. Um, so yeah. And uh, so to end, just just something to note that I'll, the um, so we have a business logic, uh, but the capability providers are essentially the I/O layers of the onion um, that help you interact or you help your services to interact with the outside world. Um, but how does this all networking work inside the cluster? So I'm just going to zoom this out so it's visible. Um, so we have our pods running in both of the clusters, but they communicate with, with each other over NATs. So NATs is essentially, you have your topics and services subscribe to those topics. So they have messages uh, being passed through. Um, and when, uh, and uh, in a scenario where a service wants to talk across to the different cluster, we, we are using NGS that essentially um, sits right between both of our clusters. So uh, NGS is NATs, um, global service. Um, um, so NAS is essentially another um, cluster that you have working as a, acting as a gateway between your clusters. So a message is propagated up and then down to the other cluster. So now is the fun time for uh, fun demo time. So, so we have our uh, terminal here, which is a, a lot of terminal windows. Um, so the reason we have this kind of setup is because um, if you go back to this logical representation here uh, that I showed you earlier, so in, on the left-hand side, we, we showed all the GCP stuff, and on the right-hand side, we have all the AWS stuff. So just wanted to replicate that in, uh, in terms of terminal, so just easier to visualize in, in this demo. Um, so yeah, so similarly, we're going to use uh, two, uh, two uh, top windows here as our um, uh, clients. So I'm just going to be using curl. So it's like curl to GCP and curl to AWS. Um, and these two uh, windows here, um, I'm going to be uh, using Stern to um, pull, pull the logs from the um, to-do actor running in GCP. So as you can see, the context is GCP running to-do actor and excluding some of the noise that we are getting from our logs, from the health checks and stuff. So just it just makes it easier for us to identify uh, the logs we care about. So I'm just going to run that. And now we are fetching all the logs. We are pulling all the logs. And similarly, I want to do the same for uh, AWS. So, so in, in the middle uh, windows, we are listening to pods on the left. We are listening to an actor running on TCP. On the right, we have our actor running in AWS. And at the bottom, um, we have our ops windows. 
And this is where I'll be doing some cube cuddle fun and pretending to be a, a chaos monkey. So I'm going to be taking down axes and bringing them back up. Um, so yeah, so this is the this is the setup, and hopefully uh, it's easy enough to follow. Um, so if I curl here, so we can see uh, we are getting some logs from the actor running in GCP. And if I make a curl request to AWS, we are seeing some logs from actor running in AWS. But we don't have any to dos at the moment, so we might as well go ahead and create one so that we can create a to do that goes to uh, our GCP service. And then we can make a to do saying something hello to GCP, just so easy to identify. So we make a request and our actor running in GCP uh, handles our request. And similarly, um, we can actually, well, let's just curl that to show that how our actor running in AWS is still able to fe fetch the data from Redis running in GCP. So it has the consistency already, so it can see the data. And that was quick. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just create a to-do from AWS as well, just so we have two easily identifiable to-dos that we created. So I'm just going to call this hello to AWS. And before I do that, I should clear these consoles. So I'm going to go ahead and create that. So yeah, as expected, our request to AWS is handled by the actor running in AWS. And now I'm just going to make a get, re get request again, and we should be able to see uh, the two actor, the two, two to-dos that we just created, and uh, they're already here. So we can see our hello to GCP and hello to AWS. And similarly here as well, so we can see the, uh, both of the actors when we call from uh, GCP. So what I'm going to do next is, um, as I said, I'm going to be a chaos monkey, and I'm going to go ahead and delete the actor running in, um, sorry, uh, so the actor running in, in in GCP. So this will be um, the business logic that we have uh, that handles our incoming requests that we want to create it to do or get to do. So what what's what have we actually done? So we we initially we saw the happy path. So we saw the solid green lines where we made the request to the GCP and it did some work and responded back up. And then we did the same work with AWS, where we see the solid green lines of the happy path, you know, that, where the request is made to a to-do actor. It, it goes across to the Redis database in GCP, does the work, and then responds back to the client. So now by deleting the actor, um, we've done something uh, that's represented in this diagram. So we've uh, deleted the actor in, running in GCP um, and we can see what, let's see what happens when, when the actor uh, has been removed. Um, so that actor should be deleted. So what we can do is get the pods from GCP and see that we, the actor has been removed and we only have HTTP capability, Redis capability and the Redis itself. And if we just do the same thing to AWS and just get the pods that are available right now, um, and we should have actor and HTTP capability both um, available in AWS. So we have one actor healthy, but it's in a different cluster. So let's see how that works for us. Um, so if you make a request to GCP, um, in theory, our healthy actor should pick up that request and work with it. And then you can see that in the logs now. Um, and yeah, so just one more time. So we can make a request to GCP and it's worked and the work is done by the actor, the healthy actor running in AWS in a different cluster. And when we make a request to AWS, um, it should just behave the same as it should uh, because it has a local actor to do the work. Um, cool. And for, so now I'll just bring that actor back up. So just we can see how the cluster recovers. Um, so. Now we can see the logs coming through. So we have a WASM, um, more pods coming up. Our WASM cloud host uh, is coming back up as well. And uh, we just can, we can quickly go back to the diagram here. So what we just witnessed was I took down uh, the actor running in GCP, which made our service to fall onto the unexpected path or the unhappy path represented by the dotted line. So it went across to the healthy um, to-do actor running in a completely different cluster. Um, did the work by querying, by making the request to the database that's all back to the same cluster that request coming from and do the work and um, 
uh, yeah, resolving the request in success. Um, so what we've done now is uh, just now is we bring back the service, um, or recovering the service back up, which means we are back to where we started with the full service. Uh, or both of our two do access being healthy and we should go back to um, how the things were when we started. So if I make a request now to GCP, that we can see our actors back up and can handle the request again. And we can do the similar thing. Um, sorry, actually, before I move on to move on, I, oh, sorry, that's AWS. Um, before I move on, I just want to show you the actor is back up. So we have an actor pod running. Previously, we didn't have that. And now it's all back up. And that's why we gained a successful response. And similarly, we can do the same thing as we can see on the on um, on AWS that we still have an actor available. So what we'll do is delete that actor as well, just so um, we can see both clusters. Um, how do both of the clusters handle the failover? So I'll go ahead and delete that. And what essentially we're doing now is um, is doing something like this. Um, so on AWS, the only thing we'll be left with is the HTTP capability provider, and that's it. And we'll see how that kind of works out for us um, in a minute. So what I'll do is I'll, I'm just going to wait for the pod to terminate. Um, just so we can do a watch command on here. So we can see the pod is terminating. So what it's essentially doing is just getting rid of all the um, our Ryzen Cloud host runtime with all the actors that are scheduled on it. And essentially, that just should just leave us with just one service, which is just one pod, which is HTTP capability. And that's all. So now if you make a request um, to AWS, it still works. And uh, the healthy service running in GCP um, is just handling our work. Um, even though we have nothing here, as you can see, we have nothing other than HTTP capability, that's all. There's no actors that can do the business logic. There's not even a database in the AWS cluster. It still can handle uh, the incoming request successfully. So yeah, so I'm just gonna go ahead and bring that service back up again, and we can see it will recover similarly as we saw previously. And um, so yeah, the um, you can already see the logs that the pod is coming back up. And what we'll end up with is back to where we started again with both of our actors um, in place and our, um, so yeah, we can see the action module has started. So I'm gonna click go ahead and clear. And just for one last time, we can see the recovery um, of our service back to where we started. So we can see the logs coming from the respectful, uh, respectively from the clusters they belong from, belong to. Um, so yeah, what we saw essentially is um, our uh, services running in two clusters um, or actors running in two different Wasm Cloud um, uh, runtimes and two different Kubernetes cluster and in a two different uh, major cloud providers. And we can see our service just seamlessly failing over and in a, a following the unexpected path and just recovering and, and yeah, recovering as it comes back up um, automatically. So, so yeah, that's what I had uh, to show. And now I'm going to hand it over to uh, Stu. Thanks, Ayush. That was absolutely amazing. Um, I think um, this is the first time I've seen anything like this, really, where you can have a true multi-location cluster spread across geographic locations across the world. Um, and it's made possible because of WebAssembly for lightweight portable workloads, Wasm Cloud for the application, application runtime, and NATS for location independence. I'm absolutely convinced that in the next few years, or maybe even months, server-side WebAssembly runtimes will make significant inroads into platform design, subtly influencing our software architecture on the way. And I say this because there's another thing happening here. Um, microservices that today are delineated by network boundaries will give way to much smaller, lighter actors compiled to WebAssembly that talk over potentially global messaging backplanes. Um, and importantly, they'll be freed from almost all the boilerplate code that sucks up so much of our energy today. This is already happening. This diagram shows this evolution. On top of Kubernetes today, we can layer Istio or another service mesh to, to re remove boilerplate for network-related cons concerns, such as traffic routing, role-based access control, etc. We can also layer Dapper on top of um, Kubernetes. Um, which removes boilerplate for application-related concerns like talking to a key value store or a database. 
These help us to make our services smaller and more focused. Excuse me. Then we have the paradigm shift with WebAssembly and Wasm Cloud. This is where our services are now more like actors, sitting above the network layer and representing our pure core. In the future, this may go even further, hosting immutable functions, for instance, on platforms such as the upcoming Unison Cloud. Imagine a typical microservice today. Say it's built with Rust, um, good choice, and placed in a Docker container, say Debian Buster Slim. That's an operating system which we need because we need we want to talk to services over HTTP. So we need a networking stack, and we want to write a log to standard out. We also want to talk to a database, so we need to pull in all the code to do that. Now we're quite chunky, and we need direct access to a network and routes configured to allow us to reach the database and for our consumers to reach us, maybe firewalls or at least security groups and the like. We need our team, crucially, to be DevOps capable so that we can manage all this stuff. And before we know it, we've spent a lot of time not working on our core business value. If we visualize the onion architecture or ports and adapters or hexagonal architecture or clean architecture or whatever we want to call it, we basically need to strip away all the outer layers and just focus on our core application business logic. We want to push the side effects to the edge so that we can keep the core pure and therefore simple to test. And we want to iterate on this core quickly so that we can deliver real value to our customers. Dapper allows us to do this today on, micro on, on for microservices on Kubernetes. Um, but Wasm Cloud allows us to do this even more. We now have actors that consist of our core logic, which are compiled to WebAssembly and they can run literally anywhere. Um, we can use WebAssembly to host anything, including Wasm Cloud itself. But in our demo, we hosted Wasm Cloud in a container on Kubernetes. The application runtime is built with Elixir OTP, leveraging years of battle testing, and it schedules capability providers and actors. The actors talk to capability providers through a contract declared with Amazon's Smithy IDL, which is protocol and language independent. The capability providers are where the side effects are. We build them once and we use, uh, um, or we use a first party provider out of the box. They're just like frameworks of old, but they're independently scalable and resilient and also language agnostic. Um, this theme has come through from through from Istio and Dapper. It's the same sort of thing, like pulling this stuff to the edge and doing it once instead of every single time. Um, so Wasm Cloud has this concept of composable actors compiled from any language into WebAssembly that talk to the capability providers, which can be either first or third party. Actors are scheduled to run on hosts that self-form into a self-healing lattice made from a NATS backplane. The NATS is crucial here. It's amazing. It's the key to all this. A simple yet incredibly powerful PubSub based messaging infrastructure, which is itself a platform for building platforms. That sounds familiar. Any NATS infrastructure can be used. And in the demo that Aish um, did, we used NGS, which has endpoints all over the world. It's a global communication system from Synodia. Synodia. If a Wasm Cloud host can see a NATS leaf node, then it can join a lattice. Hosts or nodes can join and leave this self-healing lattice. Hosts are just compute that can be donated from anywhere, any cloud, on-prem, any edge or IoT device, even a web browser tab, because as I said earlier, Wasm Cloud itself has been compiled to WebAssembly and can run in a web page. For the first time, as far as I'm aware, we can have truly global cl clusters spread across geographical locations, all because of NATS and Wasm Cloud. NATS flattens the Wasm Cloud lattice and elevates it above the network, allowing it to be independent of network topology, no more firewalls or perimeter-based security models. But NATS is even more secure, making extensive use of public key cryptography to provide a secure multi-tenant substrate or backplane on top of which we can easily build globally distributed systems. So what does a next-gen full platform look like? In, large, in a large enterprise, you might expect 
a single global multi-tenant NATS backplane to be the ceiling for the infrastructure team and the floor for the platform team. Wasm Cloud becomes the ceiling for the platform team and the floor for the application teams, and it provides a great developer experience for building modern distributed applications with high velocity and a core focus on building customer value. Um, that's us. Um, we hope you've enjoyed it um, and the demo. Thanks, Ayush. Um, thanks for listening. We're here for any questions if you have any, um, and these are our details. So hit us up. Thanks.